Hey everybody. So we're talking about sex this week. You're going to have a couple of videos to watch besides my lecture. Um, after you're done watching this, you're going to see a guest lecture from uh, a woman at Planned Parenthood who's going to take you through kind of the nuts and bolts of sex so that I don't have to. <laughs> um, it's awkward. It's fine. Everything will be fine. We'll hold hands and we'll get through this together. Um, it's not normal to talk about sex in, with your professor. It's really not normal to talk about it like over the computer for a Zoom call. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, we're going to talk about sex. One of the things I want you to think about as we go through uh, this discussion, I don't know if you can tell that she's pregnant, but we've got a pregnant belly there too. Um, one of the things I want you to think about as we go through this discussion is the way that pregnancy is portrayed in our culture and in our society, um, especially the way that women's bodies are presented in culture and in society. So what I have are three very typical pictures um, when you Google images of pregnancy. Um, I'll talk about this a few times throughout our time, but when you Google images of pregnancy and you sort of start to look at stock photos or typical photos, you get images that look a lot like this. And if you'll notice, the women in these pictures are um, all very thin, they're all very light skinned, and they are. Um, there's nothing about their body that looks pregnant save for their belly, right? And it's kind of not an, a complete accurate completely accurate depiction of what a body looks like. This picture right here in the middle looks like she literally just swallowed a beach ball and is getting ready to pop it out. Um, and even over here where we have the kind of stages of what a baby looks like throughout a pregnancy, they're very distracting in terms of this is not how big the baby is inside of her, right? So in proportion to what her body is, this is nowhere near representation of what a baby looks like. Also, if you look at her body, nothing on it really changes except for also we see a widening of the belly. And we know that when women are pregnant, their bodies from head to toe really do take on a whole lot of change. And then you also have what I like to call the glamour shot pregnancy. So if you know what glamour shots is, um, this kind of super sexy pregnant pose that's a thing now that we do for Instagram, which I don't really understand, but you know what? To each his own. Um, so one of the things I want you to think about when we, when we talk about pregnancy is just the stages of pregnancy and what you think you know um, about pregnancy. And you're going to hear from um, Planned Parenthood a more kind of detailed description of what pregnancy is in terms of how it works. Um, but I want you to think about things like what are the most common signs of pregnancy? What are the things that we know um, that women tend to know that, oh, I might be pregnant because this is what's happening. We're also going to uh, talk about, we're also going to talk about uh, abortion, um, not in terms of whether it's right or wrong, uh, not in terms of whether or not it is something that is acceptable or not, but just in terms of a fact of something that happens and that lots of people have reasons why they terminate a pregnancy. Um, I'm not really going to get into the moral part of it, uh, but what I do want you to do is take a minute and um, click over to a video and a fact sheet that I have posted um, on Canvas for you that kind of gives you a sense of why women get abortions or why people have abortions and um, if what it looks like just in terms of the many social factors that fact that play into people having abortions. So take a minute and watch that video. And when you're done, come on back. <laughs> okay, welcome back. So when we're talking about sex, the first thing we're talking about are things called sexual scripts. So sexual scripts are just basically the norms and the rules that um, guide our sexual behavior. It's how we learn what sex is, how to talk about it, what kinds of things to say, um, how not to talk about it, what is appropriate and inappropriate, um, and what to call it, all of the words that you have for sex factor into our sexual scripts. Um, for example, all the ways we have to just say the word sex. And if you really want to, you can say them to yourself right now. I'm not going to give you all of them, because even though we are an MA rated class, like that'll be the thing that one of you like screen grabs and becomes viral of me saying all of these things about sex. But there are tons and tons of words uh, that mean sex. Um, that is part of our sexual script, this idea that we have all of these variations of sex. 
We also do it with bright with body parts, right? Like instead of saying penis and vagina, you have a myriad of things that people come up with because they're uncomfortable with saying the words penis and vagina. We also talk about the double standard when we talk about sex. So this came from feminism, from feminist research, and it's the idea that men have a more permissive um, sexual script than women do, that men have been allowed to have more um, sexual behavior than women. And if women do it, this is where we get the she's a slut, she's a hoe, et cetera. Um, that's the double standard. It's the idea that that men and women are treated differently when it comes to sex. There are also components of sexual scripts for men and women. So think about these questions. What is the appropriate, what is appropriate sex for women? Meaning what types of sex can women have that's acceptable? What is appropriate for men? Um, hopefully your answer, I really hope your answer is any, like any type of sex anybody wants to have as long as it's consensual. But we know that's not true, right? We know that there are different standards for men and women. Um, and then also what role does the media play with sexual double standards? Think about those questions. So this kind of gives you an idea of how sexual expression changes as people grow. Um, in early childhood, most kids develop some sort of understanding of gendered behavior. And in middle childhood, most kids start to experiment with masturbation pretty much as soon as they figure out what their genitals are. Um, and what maybe feels good, kids start to experiment with masturbation. And adolescence is, as most of you know, when children sexually mature. So reproduction um, is also associated with a term called social control. Re social control is how we regulate group behavior. So the idea behind social control is to get everybody in line, to get everyone to comply in some way. Uh, and it is how we keep people in that line. So social control can be stuff as simple as, um, I'm recording this in the summer of 2020, in July of 2020, and everywhere I go now, or not everywhere I go, but most places I go now have markers on the ground to keep you six feet apart from the person in front of you, right? That's social control, trying to gain conformity. You have to wear masks into place, that kind of stuff. The feminist approach to social control and how this applies to reproduction is um, giving women the ability to control their own bodies, to um, be able to decide what they want to do with their body. Uh, this is also this factors in with laws. Um, laws tend to be agents of social control. They tend to be ways that we enforce social control. So when you are telling a woman what to do with her body and you're making a law that then... Um, um, what she can or can't do with her body, and you make a law that then uh, reinforces that behavior, um, then that is a form of social control because that law has now told this person, um, you are regulated to what we think is best and you're going to have to do what we think is best with your body. Uh, so one of the ways to think about this, oh, don't worry about that. One of the ways to think about this is how does a culture uh, dictate social control? For example, how does your culture, meaning your family, your religion, the way you grew up, how does it dictate your experience with pregnancy, abortion, and birth control? So if your parents talk to you about sex, uh, what did they say? And how was that connected back to um, this idea of social control or abortion or um, birth control? I also want to toss in menstruation into the discussion of social control. So um, in 2009, uh, these two people, Mamo and Foskett, did a study called Scripting the Body, Pharmaceutic Pharmaceuticals and the Remaking of Menstruation. And basically what they did was they looked at ads in 2009 that were focused on um, the once a day birth control pill, um, or sorry, four times a year birth control pill, uh, which now isn't as prevalent, but uh, they looked at these ads to try and see how menstruation was being marketed to people. Um, and one of the things they found was that it was incredibly gendered, which of course it was being marketed toward women, um, but also that there was this feeling of freedom. So you even see it here in this ad for the Nuva ring, let freedom ring and then live life your way. And this idea that you are now liberated from your period and you're liberated from something that your body is doing naturally. Um, th this was interesting because it was it's sort of a different way of thinking about social control, right? That um, you shouldn't be a slave to your period. You should not be 
connected to it. It should be something that you have and you are in charge of and you can do whatever you want with it. And, you know, that's problematic in some ways. Some people find it empowering, but they found that the, the idea was to make it as empowering as possible. Okay, so after you're done with this lecture, please click over to uh, a Saturday Night Live skit that links up with this called Annual, which is kind of a way of making fun of uh, the four time of your birth control pill. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. While we're talking about menstruation, so there are is, there is a lot of shame uh, surrounding periods. Basically, menstruation is something that is considered gross or offensive, or uh, it doesn't even it's not even called menstruation. Um, I've got a few examples: my special friend, Aunt Flo, that time of the month, uh, with this idea that there's some sort of shame around menstruation and what it is uh, and uh, having your period is something that should be shameful when the reality is it's just sort of another social form of social control doing these things right telling women that your period is not natural and that it is something to be ashamed of and you really shouldn't talk about it and it's private and it's not something to be discussed when the reality is if we didn't menstruate we wouldn't have babies right um, so it's just a natural thing that your body does the last thing i want to say about this is what I call the socialization of pregnancy. Um, so pregnancy has become socialized in our society in a couple of different ways. The first is it's very romanticized, even with these images, right? You've got a flower here, you've got the happy kind of bump holding there, you've got the little girl hugging her, her I'm assuming her mom's um, belly, not sure for sure, I'm not positive on that. Um, but there is this romanticizing it that happens, this idea that it is a romantic, kind of flowery uh, time. Um, and I don't know if you've known anyone who is pregnant or have been around anyone who's pregnant or seen anyone who's pregnant, uh, but it, it can be a very happy time. But for a lot of women, it's really hard and things swell up and you know their moods aren't great or maybe they have some sort of complication or maybe they have minor complications that for them are really major. Uh, but we're sort of socialized into thinking of pregnancy as this sort of magical flowery moment where you just like go and sit on a rock and you know birds braid your hair i don't know <laughs> um, but with that comes a lot of shame and a lot of body shaming especially after babies are born so this picture went viral a few years ago um, this woman was a fitness trainer and she put her children up with a picture of herself and she's got an eight month old baby down here um super cute baby by the way and her thing was, what's your excuse? Meaning that if I can get this body with three kids under three, uh, what's your excuse? And a lot of people took issue with that. This mom um, posted a thing that said, my excuse is that I'm okay with this. So she has her infant here, three years and five years. Um, and it's the sort of idea that bodies, especially pregnant bodies, are something that should be critiqued by other people, that should be shamed. And that if you're not loving every second of your pregnant body, then there's something wrong with you. So that's what I want to talk about with sex. I want you to now go and listen to some of the experts talk about it uh, with a little bit more authority than I have. And I will see you next time.